This week is a slightly longer episode because we didn't have our regular midweek update. There's lots of things to get through, so let's crack on. Hi, I'm Prob, and welcome to News Trash here on The Geek Show, your regular look at the more interesting things that have been happening in the world of video games over the last few days. Well, in this case, the last week. It's been a very, very strange week for me. For this one, we're going to start off with our usual look at the bad stuff, and then we'll get to the good stuff later on in the episode. So, the usual, where can we start? Where can we start? Well, it's got to be Activision Blizzard again, isn't it always? This time, six state treasurers are leaning on Activision Blizzard. These are investment and financial heads from California, Delaware, Illinois, Massachusetts, Nevada, and Oregon, and they've asked for a meeting with the company's board of directors to discuss Activision Blizzard's response to the ongoing scandal. Now, one of the things that's been confirmed is that Illinois do have investments in Activision Blizzard. We don't know whether the other states actually have any investment in Activision Blizzard as well, but we can surmise that they probably do since they are demanding meetings and other states haven't actually demanded any meetings. So it's a good bet that those states do have some financial input or financial gain, something to gain from the whole thing with Activision Blizzard, or something to lose. But that's not where it ends for Activision Blizzard, because you know you've hit rock bottom when even the right wing is starting to give up on you. The National Legal and Policy Center, which is a right wing organization that promotes ethics in public life, has written to Coca-Cola chairman and CEO James Quincy. They have asked that he immediately seeks the resignation of Activision Blizzard CEO Bobby Kotick from the company's board of directors, on which Bobby Kotick also serves. So he is also on the board of directors of Coca-Cola. The letter goes on to point out that Coca-Cola has been quick to act publicly in other controversial public policy issues, like speaking out against Georgia's Election Integrity Act. So they're expecting the Coca-Cola company to get rid of Bobby Kotick as well, which is just piling the pressure onto Bobby Kotick. And to further compound matters, and this, I suppose, is more of a blow to the people who are supporters of the employees at Activision Blizzard who've done nothing wrong, who are just simply hardworking, normal people trying to do their jobs, but they're kind of caught in the crossfire. Jessica Gonzalez, she's a key figure in the employment action at Activision Blizzard. She is leaving the company and quitting video games development. She announced her resignation earlier this week, and in a message, she further criticized Activision Blizzard boss Bobby Kotick. She said his inaction and refusal to take accountability was driving out great talent. She goes on to say, products will suffer until you are removed from your position as CEO. This may seem harsh, but you had years to fix the culture and look at where the company currently stands. Now, according to Jessica Gonzalez, she is putting her well-being first, and that's the reason for her decision. But it's a damning indictment of the state of video games that these things continue to happen. But that's not where the pressure for Activision Blizzard ends, because uh, piling on to the whole thing is Jeff Keighley, who has said that Activision Blizzard will not feature as part of the Game Awards beyond their nominations if they get any. He's gone onto Twitter and he's basically said the Game Awards is a time of celebration for this industry, the biggest form of entertainment in the world. There is no place for abuse, harassment or predatory practices in any company or any community. He goes on to say, I also realise we have a big platform which can accelerate and inspire change. We are committed to that, but we all need to work together to build a better and more inclusive environment so everyone feels safe to build the world's best games. And he's right. Anyway, moving on to another damning indictment of the state of video games. The Writers Guild of Great Britain has reported that 53% of game writers have experienced or seen bullying at work, and goes on to say that 48% of writers have either had burnout or stress-related illnesses. Now, this is according to a small survey of 800 industry workers and Writers Guild union members, but you can extrapolate from this small sample that this is probably prevalent within the video games industry, especially if the treatment of women within the video games industry 
is any kind of example. You can be sure that this is not limited to developers here in the UK or within the European sphere, but it is probably rife with developers all over the world and publishers all over the world. So yeah, yet another problem rears its ugly head for the video games industry. And I have to ask, at what point is the industry going to decide collectively to grow up? It's about time. You're the number one industry in the world. It's about time you basically take that responsibility seriously instead of acting like children. Clean out your house, get rid of the bad elements, and move forward. Every other entertainment industry has had to do the same thing. But for some reason, the video games industry feels like they get a pass because they deal with video games. You don't get a pass. Get this done. <sighs> you think the bad news would end there, but no, it doesn't end there. Because Take-Two, which is a company that probably has other skeletons in the closet, no matter what you say, Mr. Strauss Zelnick, no matter how many times you say, nothing to see here. Anyway, this isn't about that. This is about Take-Two and their trademark hammer. They have been hitting the US patent office with lots and lots and lots of uh, filings to contest various names. These names include the word Rockstar, Social Club, Mafia, Civilization, and the one that's got people up in arms, Take Two. Because Joseph Fares, the developer behind Brothers of Tale of Two Sons, and the video game and current flavour of multiplayer games for 2021, It Takes Two, has had to give up his trademark claim because he's been hit by a filing from Take-Two, because they both use the term Take-Two in their names. And they're both related to video games, which I kind of understand from a corporate and legal perspective, but one is clearly a video game, and the other one is clearly a video game publisher. There is a separation between the two, and legalistically speaking, Joseph Fares could probably win, but it's not worth the effort. It's not worth the money that's spent and that's what Take-Two are relying on. They're basically swinging their massive, massive sack of money and seeing who they can club with it. The sad thing is, all that they're hitting are small businesses, restaurants, tattoo parlours, that sort of thing, small organisations, nobody who's really a threat to Take-Two. So I can only imagine that this is basically Take-Two being a corporate bully. And if that's the case, if Take-Two as a company are happy to go around bullying small businesses and small organisations, then I have to question Strauss Zelnick's assertion that there is nothing to hide and nothing to see at Take-Two, that they're a good company. So my question is, is Take-Two a good company? Given this article and corporate bullying, and Strauss Zelnick's assertion that there's nothing to see here, I would say they're hiding something. I'm immediately suspicious. Anyway, leaving that all to one side, Titanfall. It's been a bastion of first-person shooters for the last decade, and Titanfall 2, for many people, is probably one of the best first-person shooters to be released in the last decade, and it has a lot to recommend it. Sadly, though, uh, Titanfall is going to be pulled from stores permanently by Respawn and EA. They're delisting the game from digital storefronts and subscription services on March the 1st, 2022. It sucks, but you can kind of understand because Titanfall 1 and 2 were both hit with really, really bad DDoS attacks and some very bad hacking. The games have been left in a really bad state, so I can kind of understand. The nice thing is that those games formed the foundation for the very successful Apex Legends, which is set in the same universe and uses the same weapons and has a modified version of Titanfall's movement system. So if you do want to get your Titanfall fix, then you can go play Apex Legends. It's a shame to see, pardon the phrasing, a titan of the first-person shooter genre decline so much. Speaking of declines, Battlefield 2042. EA, what were you thinking? Now, I'm not going to pile on to the big pile of derision and just the number of bad reviews that have been launched at Battlefield 2042. 
Vince Sampella is the co-founder of Respawn and then now overseeing the Battlefield franchise. Now, Vince Sampella, in his interview with GameSpot, explained that their intent going forward wasn't to replace Battlefield 2042. Instead, what they want to do is create a connected Battlefield universe. According to Vince Zampella, this is an and strategy in many ways. We will continue to evolve and grow Battlefield 2042 and we'll explore new kinds of experiences and business models along the way that we can add to that foundation to provide an awesome array of experiences for our players. In this universe, the world is interconnected with shared characters and narrative. This universe is also built with our community as we harness the power of portal and user-generated content that puts creativity in the hands of our players. Loads and loads of jargon and buzzwords in there. But what does it mean? Well, I would assume that it means Battlefield as a franchise is going to be more character-driven, more narrative-driven, that sort of thing. Still going to be multiplayer heavy. It might be an interesting direction that the franchise is moving in. I, for one, am curious. Anything is better than what Battlefield 2042 turned out to be. Anyway, moving on to the kind of middling news, I suppose you'd call it. Good Old Games have posted a year-to-date loss, and CD Projekt Red has pledged to bring it back to its basics. The storefront is going to go back to a curated selection of DRM-free games, which I think is the best way forward for it. I think it's becoming too much like Steam and other digital storefronts like that. I think Good Old Games should basically do what it started off as, be good old games, games that are hard to get hold of, games that are DRM-free, games that have history with a lot of the older players. That's the beauty of good old games. That's why I signed up to good old games in the past, and I'd love to see that happen again. I'd love to see them go back to that. Okay, moving on to the US Congress, and a new bill could ban the use of console scalper bots. A group of politicians want to take action against the so-called Grinch bots, And so they've introduced the Stopping Grinch Bots Act, which has been pioneered by various representatives and senators. Now, conceptually, the whole idea is a good one. Legalistically, I think you're on trickier ground because bots by themselves are not illegal. It depends on what the bots are doing. If it becomes a DDoS attack, then yes, it's highly illegal. Scalping by its nature, is it actually a crime? I don't know. Buying stuff to sell for a profit isn't necessarily a crime. Hoarding stuff to sell for a profit isn't necessarily a crime. Using technology to do that isn't necessarily a crime. So I think this is one of those tricky grey areas where you could pass an act at the political level, but when it comes to the legal challenge of it, it might fail. Tricky ground here. Okay, moving on. Qualcomm have announced a new dev kit that is being powered by their first dedicated gaming chip. Now, Qualcomm have been working in partnership with Razer, and they've developed a handheld gaming developer kit. It's powered by a new processor called the Snapdragon G3X, and the developer kit is a Qualcomm device. It's not a Razer hardware announcement. This is according to Razer's Director of Global Partnership, Justin Cooney. Razer have been working together with Qualcomm in this collaborative partnership and they aim to bring more publishers and developers to the table to achieve their joint vision for creating the future of portable gaming. Razer and Qualcomm have come to this partnership because the Steam Deck is a massive sea change in what happens in mobile gaming and it is also a direct threat to gaming on mobile devices. They've been trying to promote mobile phone gaming for a long time. Qualcomm see this as a direct threat They're working with Razer to basically put this developer kit out there. The dev kit features a 6.65-inch OLED display with full HD plus resolution and 10-bit HDR. Developers who are interested can find out more on Razer's developer portal. All well and good. But what's happened is some video game outlets have reported this as a Steam Deck killer and have said that this developer kit, which is only available to developers is going to be there for public sale to the consumer and will be a potential rival to the Steam Deck, which hasn't been confirmed at all. 
As far as anyone knows, this is just a developer kit. Maybe sometime down the line, there may be a variation of this for consumers. We don't know. What we do know is that Qualcomm will probably look at mobile phones that have this processor in them and that this developer kit is probably designed for making games for mobile phones, which is interesting because Sony filed a new patent for a mobile controller. Now, the controller in the patent looks PS4-esque, but it has a screen in the center with the two hand grips on either side of the screen. Only the controller is part of the patent, so the idea, I think, is that this is going to work with the mobile phone or a mobile device. Sony have been making waves in recent years with some of their mobile phones that they've been releasing, including the likes of the Xperia Pro, which is an actual professional usage mobile phone plus camera. And the second iteration of and the second iteration of that kind of pushes the pro idea even more. So given that Sony are looking at more niche areas with their camera based phones, could it be possible that they're looking at a more niche area with their mobile devices when it comes to video games? Now, I'm not saying we're going to see a return of the Sony Xperia Player or whatever it was, the PlayStation phone. You know what I'm talking about. But given modern technology, the way it is given gaming on mobile phones, it's possible that Sony are looking at making their own mobile phone, which includes several aspects from the gaming side of their company. It is a possibility, even more so because Sony are looking to launch a rival to Game Pass next spring or according to the rumors that are going around right now the idea is that the playstation plus subscription service and playstation now are going to change and they're going to become a new subscription service that combines both of them and it's going to be a tiered subscription service and there's going to be three levels according to what has been put out there the first level is going to include existing playstation plus benefits such as online play and free monthly titles. The second would offer a large catalogue of games, similar to Microsoft's Game Pass. The third tier would add extended demos, game streaming, and a library of classic PS1, PS2, and PS3, and PSP games, which would explain why the PSP storefront was pulled. So, given that's the case, and given the new controller, isn't it possible that Sony are going to have a new phone that includes PlayStation Now as part of the phone itself. Anyway, moving on to Valve, who have basically said that they're not going to allow exclusive titles for the Steam Deck. They've confirmed that the handheld should just play games like a PC because it is a PC. Now, this is probably going to cause Nintendo, Microsoft, and PlayStation to breathe a sigh of relief because the Steam Deck is already a massive, massive threat. Moving on to Black Friday... And surprising leader for the most popular games console on Black Friday wasn't the PlayStation 5, it wasn't the Nintendo Switch, it wasn't the Xbox Series X either. It was the Xbox Series S at $300. Probably a couple of reasons for that. Number one, you can get hold of them. Number two, it's very, very light and surprisingly portable. Moving into more speculative and good news, a Marvel MMO is probably in development and the people who are making it might surprise you. Now this information comes from an investor presentation that was published online and noticed by a streamer. A slide in the presentation refers to an unannounced MMORPG that is set to be a Marvel IP based massively multiplayer online game. The leader of the game is Jack Emmett, who was formerly the leader on City of Heroes and currently heads up the team for DC Universe Online. This has actually got a lot of people excited. An MMO based in the Marvel Universe is something people have wanted for a long time. It's not really happened, no matter how many good to middling Marvel games there have been. There's not really been a proper MMO. I, for one, am looking forward to this, especially if Jack Ebert is at the helm. City of Heroes is an all-time favourite for many people. Moving on to our final few news pieces, Dreams has had a new update that brings a new game within the game 
and new tools to make dream shaping much easier. Now, dream shaping is the term that Dreams uses for making games, making movies, making music, that sort of thing. And the new game is Ancient Dangers, a Bat's Tale, which is a third-person dungeon crawler, which is made by Media Molecule themselves. Dreams is available on the PlayStation 4, and please, 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 if you are any kind of creative, if you want to make short movies or music, or you are looking to make your own video games or something like that, play Dreams. Give Dreams a try. It is a massively complex really interesting piece of software so our penultimate story and we're going to go with some weirdness here there's a new chapter for the bard's tale called the warlocks of large fan and it is in the form of an audio role-playing game which is being hosted on amazon's alexa yeah you heard that right it's on that echo device that you probably have sitting around your house that you ask what the weather is and what time it is that thing. I am not joking here. This is an actual thing. I have two Echo devices in my house and I checked. This is a project that was developed in conjunction with Xbox's In Exile Entertainment and created by Wonderword, a Swedish developer which previously released other Alexa-based RPGs. And the new game, for want of a better word, boasts hours of gameplay as you pick from four character classes and explore large fern recruit companions and get into some turn-based combat yeah it's a real thing i didn't even know this stuff existed anyway moving on to something else that uh, a lot of people are really hoping exists is the remake of chrono cross it is the rumored big playstation remake yada 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 now there's an interesting interview that uh, the game director for another eden daisuke takashima has done with ign and he talks about the collaboration with Masato Kato and Yasunari Mitsuda, who both worked on Chrono Cross and Chrono Trigger. And he does state that this is a crossover that he's wanted to make since Another Eden's release in 2017. Now, thematically, there are various parallels between the Chrono series and Another Eden. I know this because I played both. And the fact that this crossover called Complex Dream has appeared is actually quite fitting because Another Eden does have various nods towards Chrono Trigger and Chrono Cross. There's a lot more in there. Go read the IGN interview. I'll put the link in the description below. It's very, very interesting. And it does give me hope that there is going to be a Chrono Cross remake. And I would love to see what they do with the games on modern consoles and modern PCs. So, that's your lot for this week. Uh, let us know in the comments below what you think of any of the stories that we featured this week. We're always interested in uh, your opinions. If you have enjoyed this episode, then you can show your support by joining our Patreon or supporting us in any way you can. Um, we also have some Patreon exclusives on Patreon as well, so do check them out. Things like Director's Lottery and our regular look at uh, the Doctor Who universe. So that's it for this episode. I'll see you all again during my normal midweek update. Until then, thanks for watching.